Okay, Joanne. All right, thank you very much, Marie. All right, so Gemma, it's just you and I, and that's the two members, which means we're court. Um, we've already confirmed that everybody can see and hear everything. Um, obviously, the facility's there to raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Jim, on the base that I can't see you, um, if you speak, it'll, it'll transfer to yeah. you anyway. Okay. Uh, all mobile devices are on airplane mode, as we're aware. Um, Marie, has anybody delegated authority? We appreciate people are coming late, but has anybody delegated any authority with regard to vote? No, nothing. Okay. So, Jim, uh, we're in agreement to move forward into open session? Yes, indeed. Okay. Assembly Broadcasting, could you please ensure that the meeting is now being streamed, please? We're in open now, yes. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome members, that's Jim, that's you and I, <laughs> to the 11th meeting of the Audit Committee. Um, Marie, you haven't received apologies except for Emma Rogan and that Alan Daniel, Alan and Daniel are going to be late, is that correct? Yes, and Emma, an apology, yeah. Okay, so we'll move into the next item of business. I don't have any uh, interest to declare. Jim, do you? No. Okay. So we'll move to the draft minutes. Uh, draft minutes are on page six of the meeting pack from the meeting of the 10th of February. Uh, you may contend that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings. Yeah. That's lovely. Then the chairman presumably will sign those minutes uh, in due course. Next time business matters are rising. Um, there are six items under matters are rising, pages 12 to 26 of the pack. Uh, at item 4.1, which is page 12, as a secretary at briefing on the decisions taken on standing order 115. Happy to note that, Jim, the usual? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Items 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4, which are pages 15 to 20, are the responses from NIPSO, the Audit Office, and the Minister of Finance regarding pay progression for staff. And um, would ask about the public, with regard to the public sector pay freeze, if staff would still progress through their their pay bans. The the finance ministers pointed out that while no decision has been taken on public sector pay for 21-22, as a general rule, progression would normally be included in any award where there's a legal or contractual entitlement to it. The audit office has confirmed that pay progression by incremental steps will be made, and NIPSO has confirmed that it doesn't expect any impact because of where existing and new staff are on the pay scales. Um, Gemma, are you content to note those responses? Are there yeah. any questions? Yes, yeah. No comments or anything? Okay. No. All right. So item 4.5 at page 21 of the meeting pack is a response from the NIAC regarding its input into the January monitoring round. So this information is reflected in the committee's contribution to the recent spring supplementary estimates debate. Jimmy, you content to note? Or have you any yeah. comments here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item 4.6, page 24, the response from Minister of Finance regarding the committee's revised position on the draft budget 21-22. Jim, are you any content to note? Yes. I'm sorry this has all fallen on you, but it's just the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> So we now move into the next item of business, which is item five, the review of governance and accountability arrangements for the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman, and we're about to receive oral evidence. Uh, I would refer everybody present to pages 28 to 125 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers. We have three experts who will provide oral evidence today as part of the today's review. The first is Professor David Hayes from the University of Glasgow, and he will be followed by Dr. Helen Foster from the University of Ulster and Richard Lloyd Bithell from SIPFA. Um, Professor Hayes' written evidence can be found at page 38 of the meeting pack. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Professor Hayes to the, to the meeting. Um, the session is being reported by Hansard, uh, Professor Hayes, and the script. The transcript will be published on the committee web page. Um, I, I would invite you. If, uh, I would invite you to, to make some brief opening remarks, if that would be all right. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much, Chair. I, I trust you could hear me, because at the beginning I could hear you, but, but not, not make myself heard. So can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can hear you. Thank you, thank, you, thank you very much for the invitation to give evidence. Uh, this topic, and I'll only be talking about the Audit Office, 
I, I don't know anything about um, the Ombudsman Service, but some of the some of the matters may well carry across. The, we're talking about an area which is not particularly glamorous, but actually very important. Uh, the public audit offices are immensely important generally. Uh, we see from the problems that have arisen in English local government uh, when things go very seriously wrong. Um, in the context of, Northern, in context of Northern Ireland, the audit office is particularly important, um, beyond, beyond the importance, the general importance elsewhere, because of two specific circumstances. One of them is that the assemblies had periods of suspension. And secondly, that because of the power sharing arrangements, there is not a conventional opposition. And one of the benefits of a conventional opposition is the opposition is there to criticise and scrutinise what a government does. In the, in the context of the Northern Ireland Assembly, with most of the major parties being in, being in government, that function very much is, is, is very difficult to sustain. So what the Audit Office does is of, is, is of immense importance. In terms of what your governance inquiry is, is concerned with, uh, and I presume there are kind of two major two major issues that you have to address with reference to the audit office. The first one is whether there should be a term limit uh, for the next uh, auto control and auto general of Northern of Northern Ireland, uh, and the second one is whether there should be a board a, a board as opposed to an advisory board that is the position now. One of the advantages that Northern Ireland has got is it's starting from a position of strength where, uh, as an outside observer, my, my impression is that the audit office in Northern Ireland is very highly, regard, is very highly regarded by, by the Northern Ireland public and by, by the Assembly members. Uh, it's not the kind of position that happened in the United Kingdom at Westminster and in Wales when audit office reform was driven by scandals. So my, 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 point, my point to the committee is that this is something which is unglamorous, but extremely, extremely important. What's very important is that one maintains the independence of the independence of the control and order general for the reasons I've already stated. Uh, that means that incremental change in terms of the governors of the audit office, strikes me as being very sensible. I think that term limit term limits are uh, are a sensible step forward. But of course, there are issues that term limits arise. Uh, to a term limit in a small jurisdiction like Northern Ireland would pro probably make it would probably make it so that that person's career would come to the end. Of, oh, a career in Northern Ireland would actually come to the end. At the end of the end of their end of their term, so basically it might restrict the attractiveness of the post to somebody say under fifty or under under fifty five. Um, the, the, the second the, the the second the second point is that Northern Ireland is such a small is such a small place, and I generally tend to favour term limits of about eight years. I think the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland might make me veer towards a slightly higher term limit. I'm more agnostic on the question of boards. The question is you have to have a board that doesn't interfere with the operational autonomy of the of the Auditor General. And you've got to in practice, what will matter very much is the caliber and experience of the people appointed to that role. Uh, I, was, I was concerned in the context of the National Audit Office, that the board might well start eroding eroding the independence of the of, of, of the control and auditor general of the United Kingdom. That does not seem to have happened, and I think it's a danger we ought, we ought to be very carefully aware of. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Fethi, I'm, I'm going to open now and, and invite Jim to ask any questions that he may have, and then I'll ask a couple. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, could I ask, um, is there enough for an independent board to do? Is there enough to occupy them? I, I think I think that's a question you have to put to the you have to put to the 
audit office itself and to the members of the board. Uh, clear, clear, clearly, there are what I, what I call in my memorandum the kind of housekeeping issues. Housekeeping issues. Uh, one of the one of the points that became very important ten years ago is is that two uh, auditor generals left left in, circ in in circumstances that were controversial. So I think that the, 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 the conventional purposes of a board in terms of ensuring that, that the audit committee works properly, that there is a proper strategic planning framework, that remuneration committee works properly, is there. But it does very much, as you imply, depend upon the fact that those board members recognise that their role is limited compared with what it would be in an ordinary public body or in particularly in a private sector context. And in terms of an independent board, from experience elsewhere, do they actually challenge or have they evolved more into a support role? I think that your, your, your formulation is a good one. I think in the context of the corporate sector or an ordinary public board, you're actually wanting them to challenge the executives. In the context, in the context of the audit office, uh, you do not want them to contact to, to challenge the control and audit general in terms about the conduct of particular investigations or about particular audit judgments or about the selections of topics. So it's going to make the system work with the full board, it's going to need a very substantial degree of forbearance on the part of the board members. And obviously one of the issues is if, if the appointments to the board became politically controversial, that, well, that might well damage the, damage the reputation of the audit office without actually anything happening. Simply the controversy about an appointment might be itself damaging. What should they be challenging? Um, I think that they should be challenging in terms of the quality of the, of the financial statements, the, the fact there is a proper framework for, for planning and governance in place. Uh, the question about the substantive content of the corporate plan in terms of, for example, work programmes, I think that is something which in this very specific context ought to be the responsibility of the controller and auditor general. Who should appoint the board? Um, I think the, the I used to work for as a specialist advisor to the Public Accounts Commission at the at the House of Commons. And the role of the Public Accounts Commission is to is to is to deal with appointments to the post of control and auditor general and appointments to appointments to the board, as well as approve the estimates and the corporate plan. So in a sense, one of my answer to your question is you should be your committee, I think, should have the role of a role of making making the appointments. Some of these appoint appointments are actually crown appointments anyway, but the actual it should be on the nomination of your committee. And how many what's what's the appropriate size for a board? Um, the no, the board should have a not. If there is a formal board, the board should have a non-executive, non-executive majority. I think, in the context of a relatively small organisation like the National Audit Office, you'd be talking about a board of five or seven. Yeah. Uh, one final point. I, I take your point about. Um, Anything other than a long fixed term would discourage younger applicants. But in other jurisdictions, are there any limitations on the future jobs that former uh, auditors can take? And should there be? Uh, yes, there are restrictions. You'd have to ask the individual individual audit bodies about the nature of those restrictions. And yes, there should be. Very clearly, very clearly, you do not want any any public suggestion that an auditor general might be influenced by future career future career opportunities. So it, that, this is a person. This is a person who is a watchdog for for the, for the assembly. But auditor generals are basically a very important part of our democratic infrastructure. 
in terms of maintaining maintaining an impartiality about the auditing and value for money assessment of, of, of public services. So yes, I think there should be, be, be restrictions on future employment. I, I did at the beginning of my opening remarks make the point that the fact that Northern Ireland is small uh, would, would make the issue of future job opportunities a more significant issue than it would be, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, in the UK, in the UK, in the UK Parliament. Uh, so I think that, you know, that if you're going to have a term limit, I, I've been, I'm on the public record as favouring between eight and ten years. I think probably in the context of Northern Ireland, I would go, I would go for ten. But one should recognise the fact that having a term limit, which I think is essential in order to avoid one person becoming too dominant over a very long period, um, I think that you should recognise that that has some practical problems. And would you have a prohibition on a second term? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. So I didn't, sorry, I, I didn't make that clear. I think more important than the year is the fact it's not, not renewable. Uh, if, if you get in a position of renewable terms, you run the danger that the choice of topic and the tone of report is actually conditioned by issues about reappointment. And in, in, the, United, in the United Kingdom as a whole, I, I, I'm not sure about the position in Northern Ireland, some recent public appointments have become extremely, con extremely controversial. And I think that any suggestion, any suggestion that the, the Controller and Auditor General was being very careful with reports to not upset either particular ministers or particular parties could actually be very damaging. And who would appoint the Controller and Auditor General? Uh, in my, in, 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 well, it would, it would obviously be a, a competitive recruitment process with internal candidates and external candidates. And in terms of the formal procedure, uh, I would expect your committee to have the decisive role. And would Commissioner of Public Appointments be involved? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know the detailed institutional arrangements in Northern Ireland, but so what I'm saying is your, com your committee would actually have a, 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 a lead role in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, um, the chairman is back in the room, so I'm going to hand control the meeting over to Daniel. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joanne, for sharing my absence. Apologies to members for the delay. I, I was in the education committee and I had to nip out for an unavoidable situation. But um, thanks very much, uh, Professor. Uh, for uh, some of those answers. Uh, the, I have no direct question at the present time, but other Jim has asked some very important questions and very interesting answers in response to them. Uh, Joanne, have you, do you, have you any questions you want to come in on this moment? I do, Chairman, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Thank you for chairing in my absence. No problem. Professor, can I just ask you, um, have you seen the memorandum of understanding that we have with the Audit Office? Uh, yes, I, I, I don't know the detail of it, but I've read it on the website. Okay, and in terms of what you have seen there, um, could you give us your assessment of how um, our Memorandum of Understanding with the Audit Office compares with other places um, and the governance arrangements there, and whether or not you see any gap? I don't know. I, I, I don't know the institutional detail in, in arrangements in Northern Ireland to that to that depth. The, 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 there, there are different institutional arrangements here. There's the institutional arrangement between the between between the, the committee between the committee and the audit office, and also the question about the board. Uh, the, 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 at the present moment, there is an advisory board for the Northern, for the, for the Northern uh, Island Audit Office, not a board that has the conventional public roles. So one of the issues that you would have to face if you're going to go to a former role is what are the respective functions of the Audit Committee as the equivalent of the, the, the Public Accounts Commission at Westminster. Uh, what are the functions of the board and what are the functions of the control and order general? So you will have a, like a tripartite arrangement rather 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 than a, a dual arrangement. So it would actually make the architecture would actually make the architecture more complex. One point I didn't mention 
is that 10 years ago, in the context of the National Audit Office, um, I made the point that what was happening is the governance arrangement of a corporation soul with authority resting in the control of an Audit General was being kept at the same time as one was imposing a corporate structure of a corporate board. And, and my view at the time was that that looked like a pretty redundant structure. I, th I think that one of the issues that would worry me now is if you, if, if Northern Ireland got a corporate structure for the audit office and the corporation's sole status was taken away from the control and audit general, that might be well seen as a downgrading of the role of the control and audit general. And the, the kind of redundant system of having two, redundant position of having two different systems working does seem to have worked in the context of the National Audit Office, but you would have to ask uh, the, the NEO board and the NEO and uh, the Control and Audit General for the UK about that. Uh, there certainly hasn't been public controversy about, about those roles. How those systems work internally is, is a matter on which I can't, I, I can't pronounce. But there hasn't been significant trouble. The contrast being, as I've said, um, one of the points about that I would make is that from outside, my general impression of the Northern Ireland office is actually highly positive, but that was very much based upon when I when I was advised of the Public Accounts Commission. And if if the if the committee shares my view that the Northern Ireland office office generally does a good job, one the changes that one get should be incremental and gradual and evolving, and should be to bear in mind the small size of the Northern Ireland jurisdiction. So, I suppose from from your expertise in other places, do you consider that there are weaknesses within our governance structure because there is there is no a formal accountability mechanism really? Well, the, the, there is a, an accountability mechanism. The accountability mechanism is from the is from the from the uh, audit office, control and audit general, of the audit office back to the back to this committee. The question is about how complex you want the governance system to, governance system to be. I mean, I think it's very, it's very important not to think of the audit office as an ordinary public body. It isn't an ordinary public body. It is. It has a role which is crucial to the functioning of democratic processes. Yes, it's just that I suppose. I mean, our our remit with regard to the audit office is purely to take a look at its budget. Um, so it, it's different in that regard and then leads to circumstances whereby um, I, I, the governance, is, there, there doesn't appear to be because the CNAG appoints his own advisory board. Um, I suppose it's difficult. I mean, are there potential conflicts of interest there? Is that the best way? What is the best means of ensuring that the body remains independent and effective, and yet that there is an element of accountability. What's the best means to balance that? I think the the, the I, I you, you're going to have to take evidence from other people about how effectively this arrangement is working 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 in Northern I, Northern Ireland. Uh, the I, I think that I think that good governance in the public sector. Is of massive massive importance for the various reasons I've already recounted, but I think that the independent independent judgment of the control and auditor general is even more important. That what what one should be very careful is one doesn't elaborate governance mechanisms which actually interfere with that in, in, in independence. And that, as I said in my earlier comment. But the, the audit office has been very important in keeping accountability mechanisms working in Northern Ireland during periods of periods of suspension. And to repeat a point I've already made, the, the scrutiny in Northern Ireland depends much more on the audit office because of the lack of a formal opposition instalment. So I think that you, you've got difficult trade offs difficult trade offs to make. Uh, unless there is unless there is specific concerns about the way the present system operates, one should think very carefully before one makes the systems more complicated. I'm relatively agnostic about whether one appoints a formal a formal board, 
at the conventional board. If you do have a conventional board, the question of who's appointed, the calibre of those people, the, the fact that they actually understand the limit, limited role that they have, they have a governance role, not a strategic strategic judgment role, is really important. Is really important. So one of the questions is you've got to ask yourself is where are the people where are the people going to come from who are going to constitute the, the board members the board members of the audit office and I think in terms of the governance um, you may well need to think more about the role of your own committee uh, when I worked for the public for, for the public for the public accounts commission the public accounts commission exercised accountability over the uh, national audit office through the mechanisms of reviewing the corporate plan and reviewing the estimates. Uh, there, were, there, were, could, there was extensive public public domain discussions about those issues. So, and from that, I suppose, to some extent, similar to our position, but... OK, so in those circumstances, um, all public bodies have policies and procedures by which they deal with internal issues. Um, is there any best practice in this regard? Um, the the um, yeah, I mean, there are various various good governance guides, including from including from SIPFA, whom I think you're hearing from in in a few moments' time. Uh, the, the 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 point the point that I keep coming back to is that the in questions about how the governance system works are important, but the question of the independence of ju independent judgment of the controller or audit general is, in my view, even more important. So basically, one wants to get both wants to get both things. But if but if I was going to take a risk, I would take a I would take a risk on the governance side in favour of protecting the independence protecting the independence of the controller or audit general. Obviously, you need a mechanism. You need a mechanism for removing a controller and auditor general who is not doing their job. Uh, in in Westminster, in Westminster, uh, from memory, this is a resolution of both houses of parliament in a unicameral legislature. It's probably going to be a two-thirds majority member, possibly, possibly with a community balance issue in the context of Northern Ireland. So, I mean, I think that you do need mechanisms to remove an underperforming controller and auditor general. I think you've got to be very careful not to, not to overcomplicate the governor's mechanisms in a way which might damage independence. And it's not I mean, one of the standard points that that one I teach my students. It's not just it's not just independence that matters. It's perceived independence that matters. And any suggestion that, any suggestion that there is not full independence uh, and that the 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 control and order general has been illegitimately influenced would ex be extremely damaging to that institution. And once you get damage, it's actually very difficult to repair that damage. But I suppose just following on then, one last question. So in circumstances, I mean, how would, bearing in mind that our only responsibilities are essentially budget and, and their, their corporate plan, how would a person ever know? How would anybody you know, ever know whether or not the CMD should be removed in any circumstance, how would you ever find out? Well, the, 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 there's a substantial interface, substantial interface between the control and audit general and the assembly anyway, uh, in in terms of in terms of auditing the accounts of auditing the accounts of public bodies, local government in Northern Ireland, in terms of in terms of the reports which the which the audit control and audit general presents to the public accounts. So there's various mecha various mechanisms of interface, and I think that if if a control if if a controller and auditor general wasn't performing, or if the audit office was losing its way, that would actually become into the public domain very quick very quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joanne and Jim, uh, and thank you, uh, Professor, for the uh, answer you provided. Some very detailed. Interesting points have been raised, uh, and uh, fully take on board uh, some of the points that you've made. Um, I have no further questions at this point. We're, 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 we're Sir, can I ask one question? Yeah, briefly, Jim, yeah. Now, um, you keep referring, Professor, to this committee, the Audit Committee, 
as having the oversight. Um, where, where does the Public Accounts Committee fit into that? You, you've obviously got more detailed knowledge of the way that Stormont works than I have. But speaking from how it works at Westminster, essentially the Public Accounts Commission, which is a statutory commission set up under the 1983 National Audit Act, is actually the government's mechanism for the, for the NEO. And the Public Accounts Committee is the client. So public, so is, is the client. So basically, the, the governor's role is TPAC, and the and the and the, the client role in the sense of processing the reports, the value for money reports, uh, accounts accounts where there's matters of concern is, is a role for, is a role for the public account public accounts committee, and and I think that though sometimes those role, roles get got confused at Westminster because of interconnected membership of, of the two bodies. I think that is quite an important distinction to make. I see your role as being a governance role, and the Public Accounts Committee has been the, the committee that actually deals with the reports and outputs of the reports and outputs of the of, of the audit office. And to come back to my earlier answer, I just thought that if you want if you want an opinion of how well the present arrangements are functioning, I would actually actually go, go and ask your own public accounts committee what they think about whether they are satisfied with with what the audit office is doing. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and thank you, Professor, for providing the evidence uh, today at the session and, and for providing the answers. We deeply appreciate it and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Best wishes for your inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, members. Um, we'll move to the, the next item, uh, review of the um, governance and accountability arrangements for Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman uh, oral evidence. Uh, can I inform members that Dr. Catherine Foster's written evidence can be found at page 48 of the meeting pack. And um, if uh, Starleaf uh, can bring in Dr. Foster uh, from University of Ulster, it would be greatly appreciated. Yes, and she's with us. You're most welcome, Dr. Foster, and thank you very much for your time uh, and for being with us today. Um, uh, can I advise uh, that the, the session is being reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage uh, following uh, today's session? Uh, and can I uh, uh, invite you to make uh, some brief opening remarks? Thank you, Dr. Foster. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for the invitation to present my evidence to you today. Um, I'm a lecturer in accounting, but I have a research interest in the area of public accountability with a particular emphasis on the role played by the public accounts committees um, in the growing demand for public accountability. And as you have your, my written evidence before you, I'm going to keep my comments very, very brief. So um, audit offices or supreme audit institutions have a major role to play in the discharge of accountability, of public accountability, as the eyes and ears of the legislature by following the public pound wherever it may flow. So the independence of the auditor from those he audits is a legal and professional requirement in both the public and the private sector. In fact, um, it could be argued that in the public sector, it, higher standards are demanded. And uh, my colleague has, uh, Professor Hughes, already mentioned um, the independence and the importance of independence. But value is derived from the independence of the audit office in a number of ways. Firstly, as the role of the auditor is to provide assurance to the legislature and to the public on the use of public resources, trust is required. And the independence enhances, uh, you know, it builds that trust and it, it, uh, it, it strengthens uh, credibility. However, in order to maintain that trust, um, the auditor must have exemplary financial procedures, governance and accountability. So the level of accountability of the auditors um, is much higher. Um, and it must be achieved while having regard to the primacy of independence. 
So I have uh, reviewed the governance and accountability arrangements in the audit offices of the UK and further afield. And um, I have discovered that the uh, arrangements in Northern Ireland are out of line with those uh, used elsewhere and with current best practice arrangements. Um, so I've made a number of recommendations. Um, so firstly, um, the Controller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland uh, holds the position currently until retirement, um, and that is not compatible with best practice. I would therefore recommend that it should become um, a fixed term appointment of between eight and 10 years. Um, if a fixed term appointment uh, is uh, made, then appropriate mechanisms need to be in place uh, regarding subsequent employment of the post holder, as this has the potential to bring the office into disrepute. Um, I recommend that the um, Northern Ireland Audit Office become a corporate body, um, that the board have a majority of external members, and that those members should be appointed by yourselves, by the Northern Ireland Assembly Audit Committee, following a public appointment process. Uh, and finally, um, the Northern Ireland Order Office is out of line with its peers elsewhere in the UK in that the external auditors of the Northern Ireland Audit Office are appointed by the Department of Finance, which is an arrangement which predates devolution. Um, elsewhere, the um, auditors, the external auditors are appointed by um, your equivalent, by uh, the equivalent audit committees elsewhere. So that's just a brief run through my evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Foster, for that. And we do appreciate that you've submitted the evidence as well for us to consider prior to today's session. And, and thank you for your opening remarks. Before I turn to um, members, I, I just have a few brief questions. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have a view on whether accountability could be improved if there was a single auditor for the public sector as opposed to a separate local government auditor? Um, well, I just um, having spent the last few years looking at the auditors and public accounts committees um, and accountability arrangements um, in the devolved administrations, um, there are um, I, Northern Ireland, in, in Northern Ireland, local government is much smaller than it is elsewhere. So we're not looking at like with the like. Uh, you know, the, the budgets of the larger pub, local government um, organizations in elsewhere in the UK um, would be very substantial, would be bigger than um, than here. You know, it's, it's a very, very small. Um, but the I know we have that in, in they're all within even in Scotland and in Wales, um, they are local government, while a separate um, body, if you like, comes under the um, Auditor General. It's well, Audit Scotland um, provides services to both local government and um, the um, central government, if you like, uh, and the same arrangements apply in Wales. Um, I don't see any need to have uh, separation here, um, and I don't think it would be particularly enhanced, accountability would be enhanced if that was the case. It's just adding another layer. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, you've recommended that the audit office become a body carpet and that this committee should appoint the non-executive members to the board. Uh, and yes. I know that um, the professor said something. Similar. Do you envisage the uh, audit office identifying potential non-executive members for appointment by the committee, or do you think the committee should take full responsibility for identifying and appointing? Um, well, uh, there could be a consultation, so you could take advice, but I think the... Um, uh, decisions should rest with the uh, committee, uh, yeah. but um, you know there is a role there for you know public appointment processes to be followed. Um, but at the moment, the um, appointees who are trustee who are um, advisory only yeah. um, are appointed by the um, auditor general, uh -huh. um, which is not in line with. Um, governance the best governance principles um he the chairman was appointed using uh you know a advertised 
public appointments process. Um, but in fact, there was no requirement for that to take place yeah. in, uh, you know, so uh, what happens in practice and, um, it, you know, may work very well. Uh, but I think we need to, you need to have a framework there um, that is not dependent on individuals making the right decision. Okay, interesting. Th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Foster. I'll open up to other members. We, we have two members that are, are not available today, but we have Jim Allister and Joanne Bunting. Uh, I, I'll uh, go to Joanne. Joanne, have you any questions for Dr. Foster? <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Foster, for your um, for your paper and for your your information of your recommendation. Just, I presume that you, that you have seen. I'm going to kind of put you some of the questions as I, I put to Professor Hood. Um, I presume that you, you have seen the committee's MOU. Yes, I have. Um, um, what gaps do you identify in there? Um, and what, what's your assessment of? Well, uh, in, in light of, uh, as I say, what's happening elsewhere, um, you know, Wales and Scotland, um, in addition, obviously, uh, to Westminster, appointed a corporate board. Um, and um, the, I, I think that is something that is missing. Um, there would be, I, th I think it would be more straightforward if there was a corporate board that reported directly to yourselves um, rather than this memorandum, um, which I suppose could be changed um, more frequently. Um, but the, the corporate board would be the standard mechanism that would be used. Right. And do you envisage that um, there would be a sheet of career progression for anybody who served on those kinds of boards? No. No. No, I mean you would you would like um, the, the the people who um, would need to be um, sort of experts in the field. They need to have some, or you need to have some expertise there. Um, so I, I mean, they uh, they're likely to be people perhaps who have um, some of them have been auditors. There might be there would be a place perhaps for having an appointee from um, another um, audit office um, in the UK. Um, you know, so that there are a number of candidates who could fulfil that role. And so, in terms of of your reading and your recommendation, are there any other gaps that you think should be fixed? Um, I suppose the big thing is the this um, the, the the fixed term. There's no fixed term appointment, um, and um, I would suggest eight to ten years. Um, 10 years would get over, you know, two um, different um, mandates um, of the Assembly. Um, yeah. uh, but I think a really important issue there would be the post-employment, uh, uh, you know, when the person stepped down as Auditor General, what sort of post-employment uh, might they, what sort of mechanisms are available there? Uh, the two that I have looked at in detail have been those in Scotland and in Wales. Uh, now in Wales, um, there is, um, it's written into the legislation um, that um, they, um, uh, after stepping down, the um, former Auditor General must consult a nominee of the legislature is what it says. Um, there hasn't been a consultation since this came into effect uh, because the, uh, the Auditor General, previous Auditor General, Hugh Von Thomas, uh, had reached retirement age and is not seeking reappointment, you know, post uh, retirement uh, employment. Um, but it is very clear in that you must consult, and um, regardless of whether it's in the public or the private sector. Um, and they are prohibited from taking up post within two years um, with any um, organisation um, that has been subject to, within the remit of Audit Wales. In Scotland, the legislation is much broader, and it just says that um, the uh, appointee will um, 
if I if I uh, just remember correctly, uh, depending on the terms and conditions set out by the uh, Scottish Parliament corporate body. Um, and so the rules, when you were making the appointment, you decided what the rules were going to be. Um, and the, I, I did put in my, my paper um, details of the um, appointment of the Auditor General, which just happened a few months ago. Um, and the, um, his conditions of employment were that um, he would uh, consult within two years. Okay, but there, so it could either be included in the legislation or say that you know, the, the, it could be set um, at the time of appointment. But I think that is an area that could give rise to all sorts of difficulties. Um, I don't necessarily agree with my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Heels, in that um, I think being Auditor General for Northern Ireland would be, um, uh, you know, an attractive appointment. Um, and I, I think there would be, um, could be quite a number of people interested, not just from Northern Ireland. Just one last one, Chairman. So Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Oh. Yeah, just, just Joanne, if I, just for you to come in, if I could just supplement the last point, but like Professor, why, why do you feel that it is such an attractive position for people in Northern Ireland? Do you disagree with the Professor on that, Dr. Foster, if you could just elaborate? Um, well, um, I uh, have just finished a, a PhD uh, last year when I looked at the public accounts committees of the devolved administrations, and I've spent, you know, four or five years travelling between Scotland um, Wales and, and Northern Ireland, speaking to auditors and witnesses and members of public accounts committees and whatnot. And um, certainly the, the, the Northern Ireland um, audit office would be held in very high esteem. Um, and I think uh, there's much more movement um, now maybe than there would have been a number of years ago. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Joanne, for cutting no, you're right, Chairman. Just I suppose one, one last brief question. You'll have heard Professor Heal say, Dr. Foster, that um, one of the strengths was that we were starting from position of strength in that the others had had to uh, embark upon reform because of scandal and we're not in that position, thankfully. Um, but um, what learning should there be um, in dealing with internal issues because of what has arisen in other jurisdictions? I think part of the problem that arose in the other jurisdictions arose because of the um, there was no term limit, in particular for the Northern for the National Audit Office. Um, the um, incumbent had been there for twenty years plus, um, and um, had uh, with fewer checks and balances than there should be. Uh, there wasn't a corporate board at that stage. Um, so, um, you know, setting a time limit um, on the appointment perhaps uh, would assist there. Um, the, 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 in Northern Ireland, we were in a very different position when de devolution happened compared to the other um, administrations because the Northern Ireland Audit Office is very well established. It was established at the creation of Northern Ireland. So it had uh, already... Um, I suppose that the need for formal arrangements weren't um, uh, as um, immediate as they were elsewhere because, you know, we already had one. This is one a bit like Blue Peter. We've already prepared. It was up and running. The Auditor General from Northern Ireland was um, used to pre presenting his reports to the Public Accounts Committee in Westminster. Um, so we were starting from a very different place. Um, but... Um, I think it, they just highlight the issues of uh, people being there for a long time. Um, now, in, in Wales, there were other issues. There were a whole lot of issues um, in Wales. Um, and there wasn't really... When devolution sta started in Wales, it was a very different model to start with. Um, and then, of course, they didn't even have their own audit office for the first five years. Um, the um, That was still the responsibility of... Um, the, you know, John, Sir John Byrne was appointed, but he was Auditor General for England as well, and he was assisted by the um, National Audit Office. So it didn't, it hadn't been established in the same way at all. Uh, but I, I, the governance is so important. You need a challenging um, board 
which they didn't have. Um, and the, uh, the, the board probably challenges at the moment, but it doesn't have that statutory footing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jim Alistair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fortier. Your, your evidence has been very clear, but I just want to pick up that last point about a challenging board. Could you just elaborate on where you see the ambit and the extent of challenge for a statutory board to the Controller um, Knowledge the General? Sorry, could you just repeat the last bit of that? I think you broke up a bit. I just want to understand what you see as the ambit of challenge that a statutory board would exercise. Yes. I think when it comes to the Northern Ireland Auditor Office, um, there are two distinct areas. Okay. So there's audit quality, quality of the work they do, and then there's the governance issues. Yeah. So very often they have um, an, an advisory board to assist with their audit quality. Yeah. There is no issue, as far as I am aware, with the quality of order carried out by the Northern Ireland Audit Office. They have internal mechanisms, they have peer review, and uh, you know where they will ask uh, colleagues from um, other audit offices to review cases. They uh, will use uh, professional bodies to come in and, and have a look as well, just to uh, main, main, ensure that they've got quality control arrangements. The board would deal purely with the governance. So you shouldn't get into a, a situation like they did with the National Audit Office and the auditor uh, having huge expenses, et cetera. Okay? Um, so it would be purely with the governance of the organization with the accounts which are prepared. So the Auditor General is the accounting officer mm -hmm. for the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Um, so it would be the challenge on those sort of issues. And does that mean that the corporate plan, for example, that would be produced would be in the ownership of the board? Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. All right. Does that mean that uh, the corporate plan which would be produced, would that be a document in the ownership of the board rather than the Auditor General? I'd have to think about that. Um, I mean, the, the Auditor General is the accounting officer and signs it off and signs off the accounts and signs off the, re the report. Uh, but the, the, so it would be, there would be um, an element there of, I suppose, joint responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you, uh, Dr. Forster, for your contribution, for your uh, evidence, and for the very clear uh, answer you provided us. We appreciate your attendance here today and, and for your. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, uh, thank you very much for, for those questions to our, our, um, our witnesses. We'll move on to the next item of business, the review of the governance accountability arrangements for Northern Ireland Audit Office and Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. This is the oral evidence session. Can I inform members that the CIPFA's written evidence can be found at page 70 of the meeting pack? And can I welcome to the meeting, uh, if Starley for bring them in, uh, Richard Lloyd Bithell, uh, Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountability. Accountancy, sorry. Uh, you're most welcome. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine, thank you. That's that's uh, fantastic. And just to re remind you, as I have with the other witnesses, that this session is being reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on uh, the committee webpage following today's session. Um, thank you for your attendance today, for your time. Uh, can we invite you to make uh, some brief opening remarks, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you for the invitation today to provide oral evidence as a follow-up to our written submission, uh, which we're grateful that was accepted by the committee. Uh, we're very pleased to provide the evidence, um, and we as a professional body um, take a particular interest in good governance across all sectors and jur jurisdiction. And to summarise some of the original points that we put on our um, original written submission, we do advocate that there's full independence from government for both bodies, um, both the Northern Ireland Border Office and the um, Ombudsman Office, and 
predominantly be uh, propelled in the necessary over oversight for accountability and ensuring that there's effective use of um, public funds and outcomes and the use of public funds. Um, we can understate that the Northern Ireland Order Office performs a vital governance function in holding government bodies to account, as well as the um, Public Service Ombudsman for its, its um, use in providing independent and impartial examination uh, of complaints across a range of public services. Um, as I've heard from my learned colleagues, those also provided evidence of a number of areas, including the term and the move to uh, from a sole, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, a sole uh, corporate to a body corporate, which will I'll, uh, quickly overview in a number of um, areas, which, as we can see from other models from the UK that we've looked at, that whilst um, there's been a reference to some scandal that's driven modernization of um, uh, audit offices, there's a, clearly a parallel, um, as um, Dr. Bost outlined on, where best practice can be moved to and the pathway to um, moving towards um, a different model, which may provide a number of additional uh, layers of governance, accountability, and benefits to the current structure. Uh, also, we want, I wanted to quickly cover if there's any potential future um, issues that the committee may want to consider around forward outlook for the position of audit in the sector. Um, so just to quickly move uh, to make some comments on the uh, non-renewable tenure term. Um, as we've, as um, colleagues have said, um, there are not, throughout the UK, there is a non-renewable tenure term in uh, England, Scotland and Wales, usually between um, eight to ten years. Um, we um, have a view that there are a number of benefits from having the um, a limited tenure term um, as it negates the um, risk of the long-term post holder can be open to external pressures, either those that are of a political form or from organisations, and the um, uh, familiarity risk that can uh, happen from a long-term position and uh, complacency that can happen in the role. Uh, for example, uh, this um, in, in the private sector, the parallel, in theory, um, shareholders would approve and dismiss these decisions. In reality, it's usually the directors make decision requiring shareholder approval only at the AGM. So the ability to reappoint or replace orders, uh, auditors over a term of office may only extend to one set of um, one set of tenure. And we normally understand that's usually a having the partner rotation that's recommended in best practice amongst the audit firms. So therefore, we um, some of the comments that have been made um, also around uh, the career prospects and the um, appetite for this position. Um, I personally believe that it would be an attractive position for anyone in, in their career. Um, and there needs to be due consideration around those who hold that post for, the, um, for their tenure, around the future opportunities that they may take and um, particular restrictions around the um, around the uh, posts they may take uh, post their um, tenure as um, control and audit in general. Um, so we do support the um, independent appointment of external auditors, um, which I uh, know is raised as a point of interest um, either by Parliament Assembly or the Secretary of State Minister of sponsoring government departments. In effect, there's apparent security of tenure in the public sector, but internal arrangements for the rotation of audit personnel would be required. Uh, for example, in the old days of the English Audit Commission, this required a review of appointments every five years, although this did not necessarily lead to a change in order. A similar mechanism is operated in Scotland, and in this case, there is an expectation that different auditors will be appointed every five years. And the same principle should um, apply to the controller and auditor general role. However, the length of that tenure, of course, possibly being longer than five or seven years. Um, moving on to the potential uh, particular interest of um, becoming a corporate body corporate, as we've seen with um, the National Audit Office in England, there was a move to this as part of the Budget Responsibility and National Audit Act of 2011, which modernized the National Audit Office's governance arrangements whilst um, protecting the independence of the controller and Auditor general in the matters of judgment, which we feel are, are very important. To outline some of the steps that this act created, it did establish the National Audit Office as a corporate entity with a statutory board. 
It also required that the um, controller and Auditor General, um, the appointments were to be put, um, appointed by Her Majesty the Queen and be addressed upon Parliament by the Prime Minister. Um, determined that the, uh, it also determined that the Public Accounts Commission is formally responsible for the appointment of the non-executive members of the NAO board and the external auditor of the NAO and required that the NAO board would agree a code of practice setting out the relationship between the board and the control uh, and auditor general and how this will work in practice and this was independently approved by the Public Accounts Commission which in essence in this step would probably be uh, excuse me, the audit, um, the audit commission uh, committee. Um, in terms of um, what um, some of the um, um, responsibilities of this board are, which we've had some previous questions on, the board would support and advise the control of the general in meeting his statutory responsibilities and oversees how they would manage and use the resources. Um, in terms of the composition of the board, uh, the board has a majority of nine executive members, including the chair, and they were appointed by the Public Accounts Committee, which, as we've said in previous um, colleagues have said, was appointed to the uh, board. Uh, but however, there is a different. Um, also, um, appointments are ratified by um, Parliament. Um, I know that um, just in terms of um, keeping this. Um, <laughs> opening statement as brief as I can. Um, I know there's a number of questions that have already been covered by, by colleagues, but I wanted to ensure there's uh, enough ample time for members to ask any particular points that they'd like to tell. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, for those are our opening statements. Um, but I'd be happy to take any members or follow up with the clerk in any detail on any particular points we might want to discuss today. Thank you very much for your uh, opening presentation and for covering those points. Uh, just as a point of clarity, so is it your view, um, do, you, do you think that the audit office here should become a body corporate? Um, I think there is a case for, for it. I think that the move would need to be particularly reviewed with a robust case as to why it would fit the local jurisdiction in Northern Ireland. Um, I think it would provide an additional level of accountability and it would open up the opportunity to look at the, number, the uh, potential statutory basis of the board, which is a step that the NAO uh, potentially is, is, is the next step for that. And there's a number of other options that are not within um, the current models that we're seeing within, within the UK, um, whether that be whether the um, the board would have um, the opportunity for extra powers that, um, that don't currently see in the UK, um, such as the powers to sanction um, or any, any other particular powers you might want to look at. Um, so I think all the remit of, of, of the board as well and whether it would have a, a greater uh, role than um, providing um, support and advice to the control and orders general. Um, I think it needs to be a fit that would fit the local jurisdiction and your current arrangements. So I think there is a case to look to be explored on it, and we'd be happy to um, look at that in more detail um, with you. Yeah, our, our current arrangements are far from straightforward, and many would struggle to find a similar example to the arrangements that we have in place. To put that quite broadly, uh, you have mentioned uh, that. Uh, uh, that if we had a, if the audit office was a body corporate here, it would provide an additional level of accountability. Uh, given the situation in Northern Ireland, we have no official opposition. Mm -hmm. So, do you feel that in in that situation that this is something that should be given serious consideration, um, give, given how we're made up, if you like? Um, I think I think so, Chair. With the um, with the power sharing arrangement. Um, Without being a, uh, um, I won't claim to be an expert on that particular arrangement, but from the uh, principle of um, having um, no political opposition, um, the internal and um, uh, governance arrangements need to be as robust as possible with as many um, opportunities for accountability and governance to, to come from um, self reflection. And uh, this board could provide the opportunity for that additional layer of accountability. Yes, uh, that's a good point. Thank, thank, thank you. Just, just a very brief 
uh, point as well in relation to the CNAG. Um, obviously, it is a very important role, particularly in the Northern Ireland context uh, of government, uh, and the independence of that office is, is vitally important as well. Uh, you've mentioned about the tenure uh, of the uh, CNAG, and, and uh, a number of the previous witnesses had uh, referred to this as well. So just for clarification, are you saying that the term should be an eight-year term, or did I pick that up wrong? What, what was the left? Oh, sorry, Chair, did you say 18 years? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, did you say eight years? I was just trying to seek out. Apologies. My uh, point on that was around the rotation of all the prison private sector that was okay. on seven years. Um, I believe that an appropriate term, which would be consistent with um, other practice in the UK, would be between eight to ten year fixed term, non renewable. Okay, that, that's grand. Most of our witnesses are similar. Um, thank you. Uh, very much for that. Um, I'll open up to other members. Uh, Joanne Bunting, if you're okay. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, if I could just um, turn your attention to in your paper, it's two point paragraph two point five point two yeah. point two, um, which is about the consideration of appropriate separation for the appointment of members to any advisory board or governance body appropriate to the organisation. This is necessary to ensure the absence of political influence in any appointment and that the correct mix of skills and experience are in place. And I think, I mean, we'd all concur with that. Mm -hmm. um, but likewise, there's trend in sure that that is balanced out equally with the challenge function and that there may be some difficulty with regard to the challenge function, function in circumstances where any CNAG is appointing its own, uh, his or her own board. Um, you know, do, do you have any thoughts on that? The best way to take that forward, how other jurisdictions do it? Um, I think um, the challenge function and, and the mechanisms for challenge are particularly important there. The, um, of course, the, the board have to have the, the appropriate knowledge and skills for um, for in place to do so. Um, but I think the, the remit and the scope of the board is there's an opportunity to review and what mechanisms they do have to challenge um, particular um, decisions, uh, investigations, or, or reports. Um, this uh, this is something we can we can look at in more detail to expand on our point. Follow up the clerk um, and. Um, yeah, I hope they provide more detail on that. On that, um, but um, is there any is there any uh, further more specific points, or is it just the the mechanism for challenge that you, you'd like more detail on? I suppose I mean no, that, that that's just I suppose a point of interest because we're trying to ensure the independence remains without political interference, but also trying to ensure that the governance arrangements are robust. Mm -hmm. um, robust enough to deal with things that. Um, the assembly may not be aware of and that there needs to be accountability elsewhere because obviously the, the assembly is seeing the outworkings of the audit office's work um, but we don't know the internal workings and the accountability mechanisms inside um, so it's just to ensure that there is the robust challenge inside and you know and to make sure there is appropriate transparency and accountability um, in terms of the, the MOU I presume Richard that you have seen our MOU um, I have seen it, but I wouldn't be able to quote it in great detail. <laughs> I don't think any of it could. <laughs> I'm going to ask you what I've asked the others, which is um, what, to your mind, are the weaknesses or gaps within that that need to be addressed in the course of this review? Um, Apart from the things that you've listed in your paper, if there's anything else. Other than what we've listed in the paper, we'd be happy to do um, a further follow-up to look at that in more detail. Um, apologies, that may be a disappointing response. Uh, and to want to loom out of here from other colleagues today, but we would be happy to follow that up with, with you um, uh, after the after this session to uh, provide a more detailed um, analysis of the MOU. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And um, John Laster? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to get a snapshot of the audit arrangements across the various levels of government in Northern Ireland. Um, we have local government, and it seems to be tucked in as an adjunct to the audit office. Mm -hmm. Then we have the devolved institutions, the 
which is the controller and auditor general proper looks after. And then we have accepted and reserved matters, uh, which are administered by the NIO. How are the audit functions for those overseen? Um, apologies, Mr. Ost, I, I missed the um, last part of your question, sorry. How, how are the audit uh, functions performed in respect of non-devolved issues? Um, Uh, apologies, apologies. Um, can, I ask, can I ask you to maybe expand on that a little bit, just to this particular way you're asking, apologies. Um. Okay. Within our devolved institutions, as in Scotland and as in Wales, you have defined subject matters which are devolved. Mm -hmm. That's straightforward in order to turn the, the, in our case, the local controller and auditor general has oversight of those. But there are some matters which are not devolved. Mm -hmm. which are accepted and reserved matters, mm -hmm. and they fall under the ambit of the NIO and some other Westminster department. Mm -hmm. How and by whom are those audit functions performed? Um, for the um, non... Uh, for, for the... Um, at, at local level, uh, in other devolved uh, functions, um, for example, if we were to look at Wales, um, they have their National Audit Office who will look uh, similarly at local authorities and uh, devolved and executive administrations and perform those functions for um, those areas with a degree with, um, a, with rotation and a number of other mechanisms to um, provide a, 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 an avoidance of risk of familiarity and, and the such risks that we've covered already. Um, in particular, um, so there are uh, similar models which uh, correlate to what I think you're outlining. Um, but is there, uh, apologies if I'm uh, going down a, a bit of a, a trail which maybe you're not asking for. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, is that kind of what you're after in terms of a comparison model with other devolved nations? I'm asking how are non devolved issues audited? How are non devolved? Um, I think um, in terms of that, uh, so, sorry, apologies, I understand what you're, what you're saying now. Um, of course, um, for non-devolved issues, um, they would probably come under the arrangements of their own, um, of their own uh, arrangements. For example, if, if um, non-devolved issues which are dealt with with Westminster, they will be uh, dealt with in the model of the Westminster's uh, accountability and governance arrangement. So there is a case for a, a, a bit of a grey area between the audit arrangements and governance arrangements, which may impact at a local devolved level, uh, which in decisions and uh, scrutiny are taking it in a more uh, vicarious way. Um, for specific things, I'd have to look into the detail of um, where those specific non-devolved issues are, which we'd be happy to if there's anything specifically you'd like us to look into. Right. And in terms of local government, uh, its auditing function is really performed as a secondary or adjunct role of our present controller and auditor general. Is that satisfactory? Um, I think there is a case um, for, um, in terms of, uh, I know the colleagues have spoken to about um, the levels of audit and uh, the pros and cons of a national audit office and the um, things that um, are the alternatives that may happen. I think there's always room for scope and review uh, and development on that. I think there's a number of mechanisms where a national audit office is in place and uh, the patrol and audit the general are um, working working with those together. I think uh, the mechanisms such as rotation and a number of other things that can go go into can improve the accountability and governance arrangements. But um, in terms of uh, what's uh, satisfactory, we'd uh, have to go into more detail on that. And uh, I suppose uh, if this review wasn't happening, then uh, maybe there's a, there's a point of uh, there's a uh, a school that may say there's maybe a view that it's not satisfactory. I'll leave it there, Chair.
Thank you very much, um, uh, Jim and uh, Joanne, for those questions. And uh, thank you for uh, your evidence today and for being with us and, and taking the time to answer some of our questions. We uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Um, just before we go to the next evidence session, um, uh, the clerk would like to come in, uh, folks, uh, if possible. So if Starleaf uh, could hold back on bringing in uh, Kieran Donnelly uh, for a few moments. Okay. Just as a follow-up from the evidence we've just received, it might be useful for the committee to write to the CNAG to ask um, what they would envisage as a, you know, a statutory board doing in terms of remit, powers, mechanisms for challenge. Also, it was Professor who um, made the suggestion about writing to the PAC to ask if it is satisfied with the outputs and reports um, from the audit office. Um, and Mr. Alistair, I'm not sure whether you were um, getting earlier uh, your last question about a single auditor for the public sector. You know, was is that what you meant when you were talking about the local government? Well, yes, uh, local government is just sort of tucked in as an adjunct. Yeah. So it, it gets it, some attention. Yeah, the Department of Communities um, designates somebody within the audit office to yeah. be the local government auditor, and yeah. um, it might be worthwhile uh, writing to the Minister for Communities asking for views on um, a single auditor for the public sector and perhaps the appropriate legislative mechanism um, you know, for effecting such a change if something like that was to be progressed. Um, they also, in the, the report that we received from um, the, the audit office, I mean, that was raised, but it wasn't clear to me what the actual gaps that, that there could be in terms of accountability because of the two separate roles. So it might be useful as well to write to the CNA to ask for further information on that. Yeah, I think that would be good, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, the other thing, government auditor has just moved to another job. That's right, and that space yeah. is, as I understand, empty until such times as Bill. So um, it, it just wasn't clear where, you know, the responsibility to central government, the responsibility to local government, and where that overlap was. So we, we, we should really get that information. The other thing um, I thought in preparation for the next evidence sessions, um, where we will have the expert from the public services ombudsman field, it might be useful to write to the NIPSO, you know, for views on the current government or governance and accountability arrangements that apply to her and her office just to inform us for the, for the next evidence sessions. Yep, that's so right. I, I take that forward. That's, yes, thank you. Thank you. Is that everything, Clerk? That's everything from me, yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Should, member. Could I just clarification? Uh, Joanne has dropped out, has she? Joanne has had to leave the meeting. Yeah, I just I'm on my finance committee, which I would like to be at not not long after half past two, and I think if I leave, there's no quorum, isn't that right? That's right. The, the only thing is, Jim, uh, 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 and I know you're you're tight for time. That this next session shouldn't last all that long, and then we're into the end of the meeting. Yeah, the, there's no decisions that we have to take. Um, the only. I'm just looking to say at the end of there's decisions around correspondence whether members are content to note. I don't know, Chair, if you want to move um, to after or to get that done, and then if there are no decisions made, you can still hear the evidence from the audit office. You just can't take decisions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we'll we'll just go to. The the next item is Dr. Skips. So, Clark, will you If you just want to move to the scrutiny schedule and then you can go back at the end yeah. to. Okay, that's fine. Right. Okay, so uh, we'll move to um, uh, the next item of business uh, briefly uh, and refer uh, members to the scrutiny schedule. Um, it's a page 193 of the meeting pack for uh, the schedule to be seen. Can I ask members if they're content to note? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. 
uh, and uh, the following item is correspondence. Uh, can I inform members that there are two items of correspondence on pages 198 to 203 of the meeting pack. Can I again ask members if they're content to note? Um, okay. Thank you. And uh, we can refer back now, Claire. Is that okay? Yes, that's grand. Okay, thank you, Mr. Allison. Uh, okay, we'll move to the next item of business. Uh, consideration of the Northern Ireland Audit Office strategic documents. Uh, can I refer members to page 139141 of the meeting pack uh, for the relevant papers? We can inform members that Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, and Mr. Rodney Allen, Director, will uh, attend the meeting uh, to brief members uh, on the uh, Audit Office's core strategic documents. Uh, Kieran, Rodney, you're both very welcome. Uh, very glad to see you. And, um, uh, I invite you both to go straight into your uh, remarks. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, you forgive me just for making a couple of points. I was listening into the, the earlier session there, and um, the last point was about decisions on the corporate plan. We're actually inviting the committee to endorse uh, our draft plan. It's in draft format, and it's all. Sorry, my apologies. There's interference coming from somewhere, uh, and it's, 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 it's drowning out your voice, so I can't hear. Is there two devices running in the one room? Uh, no. It, it could be a mobile. Has anybody got a mobile on? It needs to be in airplane mode. Okay. Uh, Kieran, try now just to see. No, we're, we're, we're complete, you're completely silent now. I can't hear anything. Chair, just while we're, we're, we're waiting, I think um, CNIG was trying to say that within this briefing, there is actually a decision to be made on whether the committee is content to endorse publication of the draft corporate plan. So you might want to do that before Mr. Alistair leaves the meeting. Yes. Okay. I don't see any issue with it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Kieran, have you a volume there now? It's completely gone now. Um, just check in with broadcasting. Yeah. Kieran, do you want to try very quickly going out and coming back in? That that sometimes works. Okay. Sorry, but this, uh, Jim, I know that it doesn't help you. Okay, if um, broadcasting could bring back in Kieran Donnelly and Rodney Allen when they're clicked in. Yes. Kieran, can you hear us? You're still low volume there. Have you unmuted yourself? Yes. I think they're having technical assistance now, so hopefully. Clark Broadcasting hasn't muted them, has it? No. Um, do you want to suspend for a couple of minutes? I'm just conscious that Mr. Allister's time is extremely limited and we need a quorum of two members. Mm. Yeah, Jim McDonald's is not from the assembly side, it's from the part of office side. Might be the daughter on the working of Starlight. 
<laughs> I'll second that completely. <laughs> <laughs> During the education committee today, might have cut out two or three times too. It's very frustrating. Yeah. I must say, I find Zoom much more reliable. But... Yeah, so do I. Mine's never cut out. Um, okay. Would you like me to ask um, broadcasting to cut the live feed until we get sorted? Yes. Maybe, maybe they need to be connected to see if they work. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Thank you, and uh, we, we, we've all suffered those technical difficulties over the course of the last year, so uh, it's fine. Uh, just just before I go into the, 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 is it appropriate to agree the draft corporate plan first now, or uh, allow Kieran to go ahead? What, well, you have both read uh, yeah. and considered the corporate plan, and you've already formed your view. So, um, if if you want to express that now and then hear the evidence or hear the, the contribution. Yeah. Well, okay. I have a couple of questions for is that maybe I'd like to hear the answer to before we do that. But before I leave, then I'm certainly agreeable to it being dealt with. Is that acceptable, Karen? Yes, it is. Uh, Kieran and Rodney, apologies for, 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 for moving this about slightly. Jim is another committee and is clashing and we're slightly over. So uh, we'll agree that so then we can continue then even in Jim's absence as far as I know. Okay. Sure. sure. Okay. okay, Jim. Chairman, if uh, CNIG leads for about, about five minutes, is that helpful to Mr. Alistair? Yes, yes, I, I have 10 minutes or so. Great. Thank yeah. you. The, the, Jim, just, just to clarify, your questions are off the CNAG, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's okay. That's okay. Okay, so remain, remain there, Rodney. <laughs> that's grand. <laughs> okay. That's grand. Okay, Jim, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, yourself. Uh, Kieran, Rodney, you're both very welcome, and thank you very much for being with us and, and, and uh, for offering up your time. Um, we, we do always appreciate it. We uh, appreciate these are extremely busy and compl complex times, so... Thanks for being with us today. I, I'll pass to Jim Allister for, uh, for for now. Okay, Jim. Sure, I'm happy uh, if Kieran wants to say his piece first, but whatever. Oh, that's okay. Well, that's even better. That's even better. Okay, Kieran, the yeah, floor is yours. Uh, uh, if it's, I, I would like to come in on Mr. Allister some of the questions he was raising. There, just one question where he asked a witness about the reserved areas. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you're thinking of uh, Human Rights Commission, Trades Commission, yeah. Electoral Office. Those are audited uh, directly by the National Audit Office. They send teams over here to do those audits. They used to actually subcontract them to us to do them now themselves. So I just want to register that point. I thought that you once had a role. Aye. Uh, 
um, but uh, it was a subcontractual role, uh, and we, we always had a subcontractual role uh, with the National Audit Office before justice was devolved. So we would have done all the justice on, on behalf of the National Audit Office. Uh, but once the evolution of justice came in, uh, the residual areas, they decided they would audit those themselves. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, just to get into the, the actual corporate plan, so uh, with pleasure in introducing uh, the plan to yourselves. Uh, I'll try and cut through it uh, to the main points. Uh, the first thing was uh, uh, th this plan isn't produced in splendid isolation. It's underpinned by quite extensive what we call stakeholder engagement. Uh, uh, and that is with uh, including engagement with people yourselves, elected representatives, uh, senior people in the civil service, arm's length bodies, outside bodies. Uh, and uh, I think that our board, our advisory board was mentioned earlier, they also had a role, we workshop this uh, document with our advisory board uh, and also unions uh, would have been involved as well. So, uh, and it's all the better for that uh, process of engagement. Now, uh, there, to distill it all down, uh, we've identified three strategic priorities. Um, and uh, most of what we do doesn't change that much from plan to plan or from year to year, given the nature of what we do. But there's changes of emphasis, and that's important. The, the first one there is to support and promote high standards of public administration and financial management. And that's on page 14 of the plan. You can see that. Uh, most of what's in there was always there. So there are things like promoting a strong counter-fraud culture across the public sector. Uh, but the one that is new is to promote high standards of leadership and transparency across the public sector. I suppose given the fallout of RHI, there are a lot of questions about transparency and, and we'll have a renewed focus on transparency uh, as we move forward. Uh, the second uh, strategic, I suppose, priority is, is uh, and this is territory we've been in this last few years, is to influence the pace and direction of public service transformation by providing independent insight. Uh, and we do that through a value for money audit program. Uh, I suppose an example of that is uh, quite a big report we delivered recently on the capacity and capability of the civil service. Uh, and uh, the reason we went into that space, uh, I suppose we had done reports, many reports over the years where we're dealing with the symptoms of problems like skills gaps. And in this case, we wanted to get into the underlying causes. You'll see also in there that uh, we're, we're, we're very focused on promoting opportunities for joined up working across the public sector and getting the different bits of the public sector to work better together. We're uniquely placed with a bird's eye view over the whole system, including local government. Uh, so uh, th that's in the, the second one. The third one is, is really that we ourselves are a high performing organization to meet emerging challenges. Uh, and I'll just maybe pass to Rodney who will cover that internal dimension and register a couple of points. Just very quickly, members, we, we provided in your pack a few of the papers in relation to our business transformation program, and that's very much in this space. So you'll see within those papers, we've got five pillars. And I suppose we would ask you particularly, members, to note um, a couple of key areas. Our, our people our people pillar, um, so we have a, a people strategy in place for the organization. And one of the big goals for us in the period ahead is to become an accredited uh, investor in people um, and we've commenced that journey and the accreditation process is live at the moment and that is underpinning many of the strands of the people strategy and indeed our, 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 our HR roadmap. Um, another area and actually very pertinent to your discussions today, we've called the strand, or the pillar, sorry, governance and audit practices. Governance you're covering in quite some detail and you have a submission from us um, on that. We're also we're very focused at the moment on audit practices. A lot of change in the profession. You'll be aware of, um, let's call them scandals like Coraline and the impact that is having on private sector um, accountancy firms and how they're having to split their business off between their, their, their audit and their, their managing consultancy roles. Um, so keeping a very acute, watchful eye on the impact for us as public auditors because you'll be aware that we uh, contract um, about 25, 30% of our business with those particular firms. 
So in terms of the internals, there are other pillars, communication, engagement, digitalization, and of course you'll be aware of your supporting us on our, our refurbishment on our, our workplace of the future. And happy to pick that up when we when we come on to that particular agenda item. Okay, maybe we'll stop there. Uh, just to pause, and uh, if there are any any questions so far. Thank you both uh, for that, and uh, appreciate uh, uh, that that the, you has made a brief for us. So so thanks very much. Uh, I'll go to Mr. Alistair, and then I, I come back in. Okay, Jim. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, you mentioned there that. Um, uh, I think it was page 14, maybe you said, that uh, you have various commitments, transparency, etc., across the public sector. Does that include local government? Uh, well, for the office as a whole, it includes local government. And, uh, but uh, there's quite unique arrangements on uh, the appointment of the local government. Order. I personally have no remit on judgments made in that space, uh, but the local government uh, function is part of my office. And that goes back, there are quite unusual arrangements that go back to 2003, uh, when uh, local government audit uh, was part of the old Department of the Environment. Uh, oh. Now we have mentioned, and the clerk has touched on this, uh, you know, is there a case for actually Looking at this uh, legislation, uh, there could be murder. And, uh, I, I suspect the rationale for the, the thinking almost 20 years ago was to separate out uh, accountability to taxpayers on one hand and accountability to ratepayers on the other. Uh, but uh, I suppose we've all evolved over, over that period of time. Uh, and what is important is having good joined up uh, arrangements across government. So some of the things that I would be interested will look at things like waste management, straddle the boundary between the central government and local government. So uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, Wales in particular, uh, their CNG, CNAG is a one-stop auditor for central and local government. Uh, it works different in other places. So that's something that probably is worth looking at. Is there a county, an accountability gap at the moment? I, I suggest it probably is uh, because um, where there are generic issues that crisscross uh, the local government arena, uh, who, where do those go to? Is there a committee of the assembly that consider those now? If you look at Scotland, uh, the Public Accounts Committee in Scotland uh, will reserve one session every year for generic issues that are crisscross local government. So it's something that. Um, it could be further discussed and teased out, I suggest, Mr. Alistair. Yeah, well, I welcome what you've said. I do think a one-stop shop would be much better. Uh, and I think there always is a bit of a question mark over the uh, auditing and control in local government. And now, of course, we're currently without a local government auditor. Is that correct? Uh, we're not. Um, my... Um, my chief operating officer actually doubled up as local government auditor, and she's moved to the legacy last year's new. Uh, so that vacancy has been filled. Uh, so we have an interim appointment there at the moment. And uh, once I fill the, sorry, Mr. Alistair. Who's the interim? Uh, Cadet Kane. I see. And uh, when will the post be permanently filled? Uh, well, I am this week. We will be by the end of this week. I hope to have a new chief operating officer. It's not necessarily the case that the the chief operating officer would be designated as local government auditor, but I, I will have to look at the across my team. So what happens there? The, the actual in law, uh, the designation is actually made by the Department of Communities with my consent. It, it's quite much, uh, anachronistic. Uh, so it's not that I have a, a dedicated uh, local government audit that does nothing else. Um, the local government audit function is fully integrated, uh, you know, into my office. The people that do local government audits will also do central government audits. Back many years ago, it was a sort of a freestanding, semi-detached division of, of the office, but it made sense, and uh, you know, because there's not 
the standards we apply in local government audit are not much different to central government audit. So we mainstreamed it into the, fully mainstreamed it into the business, I think, when I became CNAG. Uh, so, um, so, 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 yeah. Is the interim appointment a departmental appointment or your appointment? <laughs> Formally, it's a departmental appointment, uh, but um, you know, in a sense, it's uh, I have a, a say in it, uh, or, or I have a big say in it, probably. Yeah, uh, in, in the real world, as opposed to the how it's how it's constructed in the legislation. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you on page ten of your report. Yep. In the investigations, paragraph four three, I think it is. Yeah. For the year that's about to finish, it's effectively blank. It says on investigations twenty twenty. Uh oh, uh, right. Okay, that's always deliberately blank, uh, Mr. Alistair, because that's demand-led work. Okay, so uh, in other words, um, we can't plan in advance uh, a couple of years ahead what investigations we're going to do. Uh, let's say if somebody, and it could be an MLA, comes to me uh, with a concern over a conflict of interest, then I would want an investigation. I, I, don't, have, uh, I don't think we have any loud ones at the minute. We have quite a few in the past, uh, so they're demand led. So what uh, are there in the year that's about to finish? Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, uh, there's exactly one. You're familiar with, Mr. Alistair. Uh, we concluded on um, it was through your office. There were concerns raised on a landway project. We, we did a, a short report on that. So that that would be an example of a, a demand-led type of investigation. Is that the only investigation this year? Wait a thing. I, I need to think there are others. Um, um, can I come back to you on that? Because uh, we've done quite a, a number of them over the years, so uh, I, I just can't. Um, can I come back to you with a written, okay. a written answer on that? I'll give you the f fuller details. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Sure, I'm going to have to skip off to find yes. out. Okay. Uh, to approve the draft. Yeah, that's grand. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Just for, so for the sake of public record, you're content to endorse the Audit Office draft corporate plan in advance of publication? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Kieran, uh, Rodney, uh, again, thanks for being with us. I, I just have the, 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 the one question. Um, when developing the plan, um, how much thought was given to increasing openness during the process of investigation or in or in uh, pre preliminary findings? Sorry, Chair, I didn't. There was a bit of interference there, so I didn't. I think it was Jim's beeping out just. Um, so, with developing the corporate plan, uh, how much thought was given to increasing openness during the process of investigation uh, and or uh, preliminary uh, findings? Oh, you mean when a uh, uh, right when a it's when, when we commence a study? Um, normally, uh, you know, we'll not divulge findings until we're actually complete. So there is a uh, so it depends on the on the case, but uh, we we would uh, if it's a value for money study, we would go through what was known as a, a clearance process with all the with the relevant department and the stakeholders, but we wouldn't have public comment uh, really until we're, we're ready to publish. Uh, so in other words, um, we wouldn't be coming out publicly with draft findings okay. normally. So we wait till that, that process is concluded. But that said, uh, it depends on the type of study. Uh, a lot of our work, there'll be a lot of um, engagement with uh, stakeholders and interested parties, not just within departments, but outside. Okay. Uh, and uh, so there, there's a lot of, of engagement, but we have to protect the confidentiality of the process until yeah. we have reached the, the end of it. Okay. Uh, that, um, but uh, we, we would put up things on our website on um, 
I suppose, work in progress and where, where, where it has got yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that, that's helpful. Uh, um, we have a, a slight bit of time left. Is there anything you want to bring up? Is there anything you want to, to say to me? Oh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, we, we went through that at a great pace. <laughs> so, uh, today, we, we, we've, we've had to some, some apologies. Some members had to leave early, and then there's always a clash. So, so I'm always coming from education, and then Mr. Alistair has to leave to go on to another committee. So it, it just that's, that's unfortunate today. But we, I've, I have some time now if you want to raise anything else. Uh, okay. Um, well, the, the plan is the plan is pretty self-explanatory, and a lot of the expenditure material in it you've already considered. Uh, but uh, we always see this document as part of a trilogy, uh, and the other part of it is our public reporting program, uh, which uh, goes along with. We're currently revising our public uh, reporting program. Uh, it was a three-year program, and. Um, that's worked well for us. Uh, in other words, you say, we're, we're sort of telling the outside world and our auditees, uh, you know, not just what we're going to be doing in the next six months, but mm -hmm. what we might be doing next year and the year after. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's helpful in a sense. Even government departments will know, well, the audit office is going to look at this. So there's a deterrent effect, uh, you know, just the very fact. That, that we actually say we're going to come into an area. So we had signaled for quite some time, for example, we're going to do a study on government procurement, and everybody knows that. Uh, the, the, but with three-year plans, things can go out of date very quick, <laughs> uh, particularly with COVID. Uh, uh -huh. So we've had to completely recalibrate what we what our plans were in the light of COVID. Uh, is probably the biggest thing uh, that will impact, and you'll see that in the in the document. Um, so some of the, the topics that seemed good ideas at the time, a few years ago, we, we have sort of put in the back burner. We have one on traffic management. Yeah. <laughs> There's not much traffic congestion at the moment uh, yeah. with, with COVID. Uh, so there's other ones that I'm really interested in, stuff like building entrepreneurial skills. Uh, there are things we'll get back to, but we've shunted those maybe a bit further down the line to leave space uh, for the, the many issues around COVID, uh, we will be doing a study on the procurement of uh, PPE. We just have to get into that that type of space. Uh, we can't cover everything in COVID, but um, one area that it will bubble up is on on the accounts. So because of COVID, um, accounts will be pro uh, it'll take a bit longer to do audits and it'll be a bit more costly. Um, in terms of what we actually find in audits, uh, we will have to do a bit more test drilling into the huge amount of COVID expenditure because the normal control environment uh, will not be there. In other words, schemes introduced at pace. It's very important that the learning from early schemes then is read, read out, you know, because uh, and we do acknowledge that people are working uh, round the clock at extreme pace. We don't want to be in their face, so whether they're middle of a crisis, but there's some things we're going to have to come back to on COVID. So COVID will impact on us in terms of we probably have more reports on individual accounts where there are big tranches of uh, COVID-related expenditure. Uh, we will have uh, overview reports on just tracking COVID expenditure. We already did one a couple of months ago. We're doing a further update. We'll cover COVID uh, as an issue, as a subset within other reports. We have an interesting report coming out on the rollout of broadband. And uh, with everybody working from home, it's such a topical issue. So, uh, does, we've, that in, does that yeah. take in consideration Project Stratum, Kieran, and the investment? We yeah. will be doing, I've decided uh, recently, uh, we're doing two reports, one on the, the, the old, um, well, the earlier expenditure in broadband under PT contracts, yeah. uh, but I've decided to do a follow-up on Stratum, and that has already started. So that's hugely topical, very, very important. And there's a COVID dimension to that. We're looking at personal independence payments in, uh, in the well community side. And again, there's a, a COVID aspect to all of that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how the vulnerable are, are, are being looked after during this crisis. Uh, we're probably a bit light on health. Well, we, we had done a lot of work pre-COVID on health, but uh, given that uh, 
they're in crisis and they're, they're a lot of firefighting has gone on. We have sort of stepped back a little bit. We'll get back into that space once the, the crisis lifts. And of course, uh, the National Audit Office uh, have a stream of reports on, on COVID, uh, test and trace, for example, there's one coming out. And the lessons from those can also read across to here, you know. Yeah. Uh, they, they have a much bigger resource than we have, and they'll be looking at some of the, the schemes at a more national level. Yeah. So COVID really is coming into and, almost everything we do. And Kieran, g- g- given the challenges of COVID and the, you, you know, the vast amounts of public expenditure and intervention in, in so many different ways, uh, how much pressure does that add to your resource? Have you got the resources there to deal with that, to provide these uh, necessary reports, if you like? Uh, well, well, thanks to you and your committee, uh, Chair, that uh, you've approved our, uh, our our last estimate. That'll help us enormously to build up. Uh, and we're still sort of below complement. Uh, we're building up to, to one, two, five. One of the ironies, actually, uh, of this, uh, we've been able to recruit quite well in the market uh, at the start of COVID, uh, whereas uh, maybe we're so we have more applicants coming through. And I don't quite know why that is, but that's good. We've got some new people into the organization. We can always do with more, uh, but um, we're thankful for the, the approval of the estimate. Sure. Yeah, and, and, what's, and what's most important to us uh, is, uh, is more getting longer term, certainly in the funding. Uh, in the past, Chair, sure, sometimes I would have a load of money left in my budget at the end of the year, but I couldn't spend it. I couldn't, because most of our spend is on staff. Yes, uh, I, I would need the security of knowing. Well, uh, I've got the money this year, but will I have it next year and the year after? Is the baseline that's really important in our type of business? But where we have a bit of surplus cash, many we we'll surrender that back into the system uh, as soon as that materialises. But protecting our baseline going forward is is, is probably our main ask. Okay. No, the, the, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, obviously, you'll recognise. Uh, I've been very clear the role of the audit office is vital, particularly in the non learning system of governance. But now more than ever before, I just wanted to be very clear uh, that with the challenges that our society face uh, in every single way, uh, that use are proper resource to carry out it. Because there is still a strong expectation in the, in the public domain that all decisions by ministers, regardless of crisis, are properly scrutinized and checked, particularly uh, following RHA and other uh, 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 examples as well. So I think whilst we are in the midst, uh, we are in the middle of it, we're through the worst of it, I would like to imagine at this stage uh, of this pandemic, uh, uh, people will still expect that level of scrutiny, albeit give people time at the present time to get through it, but in the hope that ministers are following the proper procedures when it comes to public funds. Uh, there's an interesting point there um, about ministerial directions, um, about all ministerial directions uh, were, I suppose, the, the accounting office of the permanent secretary asked for a direction from his, as our minister to spend money. Uh, there's a lot more of them during COVID. Uh, so we've had more of those during the la- since COVID started than uh, since the restoration of devolution 20 years ago. So I think... Uh, I think it was about 12 or 13 of them um, so at one stage of it, yeah. What does that do to your resource then, Kieran? Uh, there's no real bearing on my resource uh, directly. Uh, what is important, uh, where there is a ministerial direction, the rules require that uh, I am notified, I in turn notify the the PAC. Yeah. Uh, and um, in some cases, uh, that'll be a signal for, for me to keep a closer eye on that particular batch of expenditure. But it's also maybe shown the the divergence in risk appetite between ministers and officials, right. uh, so that ministers would have a, maybe a, a stronger risk appetite, uh, you know, to, to target the, the vulnerable yeah. uh, than, than civil servants, uh, and particularly you know, sometimes audit is. Uh, accused of being promoting risk aversion and uh, uh, one of my jobs is to dispel that mythology. Yeah. Uh, there is risk aversion in, in parts of the public sector, usually more at the middle levels rather than the top. 
that's not in that space. Uh, we're, we, we're, our job is to promote sensible risk management. Okay. Uh, but sometimes there, uh, uh, when things need to be done quickly, sometimes there's too much uh, risk aversion. So that's just a general sort of statement on that. I appreciate that. I just, I just have a final point, and thank you for your indulgence. But you, you've mentioned that you've stayed away from health for now uh, for ob very obvious reasons. But uh, uh, on the side of that, and as a, uh, and a result uh, 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 of coronavirus, we've seen huge issues with mental health, and, and there's big questions about the level of investment into it. Ha has your attention been diverted towards it? It has indeed, sure. Uh, and that's maybe one study that we, we're actually in the middle of. Now, it'll okay. probably take us a bit longer to, to work our way through it just to get engagement with all the people we need to talk to. So that that is a top priority study in, in health. Uh, and um, so that that's our, beyond COVID itself, that's our, our next big assignment. Now, we also did a, an interesting study uh, published earlier Mid last year on addiction services, yeah. uh, alcohol and, and drugs abuse, and there's a big health, a mental health dimension in, in those areas as well. So yes. uh, it is a space we're in, and we we'll continue to be in. Chair. So, sorry, Chairman, just to come in quickly behind here on that, we we put all of our topics through a particular lens, um, and our engagement with our stakeholders. And in this space that you're asking about in, in terms of mental health, um, the Public Accounts Committee, your colleagues on that committee um, have, been, have been very interested and, and made very clear to us the, the level of interest that exists in Kieran's products and uh, mental health. It's the next big pandemic. Uh, no, it is worrying, Chair, uh, uh, and I think uh, mental health was always an under resources sort of a service here uh you know over the years long before COVID, uh, and so but uh, with COVID, i think there are uh, many more additional issues there to confront absolutely well uh, listen, thank, uh, thank you there's there's no doubt that uh COVID has transformed everything that we know uh, that is natural uh, and has uh, also shone a very bright light on some of the real challenges in society. And you've mentioned a number of them, particularly around connectivity and broadband, particularly for those living in more rural parts of Northern Ireland. Uh, and then obviously uh, the impact has had on people's mental health to be, to be two very clear uh, lines of concern. But uh, as always, I appreciate the work you do uh, and uh, for your time today, Kieran and Rodney, uh, it is always appreciated. Uh, and for being with us. Is there anything else you want to add or are you content? Uh, no, presumably you want to talk to us on the, the governance issues. We're sitting listening in there um, and there probably there's many of the questions asked. We're more than happy to, to answer with, uh, in due course. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh -huh. absolutely. And, 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 and I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, when other members are present, it's probably the most appropriate way forward in, in relation to those sure. questions. But uh, thank, thank you yeah. very much for, for that, and uh, and again my appreciation. Um, so th thank you both. Uh, we'll leave it there today. Um, but 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 as always, if there's anything, you know we're aware. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, okay, Clerk. Um, we have covered. The agenda. Um, the only other outstanding item is uh, any other business to which we have known. Uh, have you anything, Clark? Nothing. Okay, so final item of business. Uh, the date uh, of the next meeting will be issued in due course, and the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, Clark, for your help today, and apologies for my absence this morning. <laughs>